Good day, Grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson on rates of reaction. Um, yeah, we're going to, oopsie. <laughs> We're going to carry on with rates of reaction and basically, depending on how long it takes us to get through, I think we've only got this question and the next question to do, then we're going to move on to chemical equilibria, which is quite exciting. I love chemical equilibria. Um, yes, I am a geek like that and a nerd like that. Okay, so we do this question um, and we got as far as, what did we get as far as? We got as far as explaining why, explain very carefully why the last part of both the curves A and B um, had, had were horizontal and just to remind you what was going on here we had an experiment where basically the person had taken magnesium ribbon and put it in hydrochloric acid and they had put it in excess dilute hydrochloric acid at room temperature and then what had happened is this experiment one, you could see the mass of the magnesium was the same, the volume was the same, but the concentration of the hydrochloric acid was doubled in the second reaction. Okay, that's what happened. And then they gave us a graph, and this is the volume of the hydrogen gas that was given off and versus time. Okay. I said, write down the name of the flask, Erlenmeyer flask. I said, for the investigation, write down. Okay, so we've done all that. We've done that. And then it says, explain very carefully why the last part of both curves A and B have are horizontal. Well, the reason both, just to remind you, the reason that both A and B end, I mean, go horizontal, is because the reactions have run to completion. Um, it doesn't matter which... Um, when it happens, but they do both run to completion, and that is why you end up with um, a maximum volume of 120 cubic centimeters that is produced. Okay, now it says how long did the reaction in experiment two take to reach completion? Okay, so what we need to do, we need to decide where the experiment two is. A or B, okay? It says here, which experiment one or two gave curve A, refer to the data in the table to justify the answer. Um, so yeah, it says how long did the reaction experiment two take to completion? We actually need to do those in the opposite direction because we need to actually read this off, okay? I think. Um, yeah. So if you look at this, do you agree that yeah, the curve is much faster and the only difference is the concentration of HCl changes and yeah the concentration of the HCl is double that which means that the rate of this reaction is going to be much faster than this reaction. So A is experiment 2 and B is experiment 1. They both will give out the same amount eventually. Okay. Why? Because of the fact um, that they've just changed the concentration, they haven't changed the amount of the magnesium ribbon, and you have tons of dilute hydrochloric acid. So it's not the hydrochloric acid we're going to run out of, it's the magnesium we're going to run out of. So we both ran out of magnesium in both the situations, but yeah, we ran out of it much faster, okay, because all the magnesium is used up. And I suppose that is kind of what they're also asking, hoping for you to say over here. So the experiment two is given by a curve A, which means that we can say, how long did it react? Did the reaction experiment you take to reach completion? Well, this here is 20 seconds, so that would be 20 seconds. I'm just kind of giving the answer away. Then it says which curve A or B represents a faster reaction? Well, this is obviously going to be A, and it says refer to the shape of the curve. Why? Because the gradient is steeper. Gradient is much steeper, right? Now it says, why is it important that the same mass of magnesium ribbon and the same volume of HCl is used in both experiments? Well, because the thing that we're changing is the concentration of the HCl, which means that everything else needs to be um, constant for it to be a fair 
test and they were actually looking for that phrase fair test in other words they want to say we want to have these being controlled you need to have controlled variables controlled variables in order for it to be a fair test that's what they're really asking so state a conclusion that can be drawn for this investigation well remember that a conclusion has to be similar to a hypothesis in the sense that your conclusion okay your conclusion has to be correct in this case you can't be incorrect and it has to um, compare two variables or relate to variables to each other so your conclusion cannot be oh well experiment two is faster okay or experiment one is slower um, what it has to say is that an increase in concentration increases the rate of the reaction or an increase in the concentration increases the rate of reaction you need to compare two variables you have to compare two variables now it says the equation for this reaction is given as as follows magnesium plus 2 hcl gives you magnesium chloride plus hydrogen it says calculate the total mass in grams of hydrogen gas that was produced in this reaction assume that the molar gas volume at 20 degrees celsius is 24 decimeters cubed okay so i need some space to write so i'm going to delete everything i can delete from here so let's erase all ink okay it gives a little bit more space now what do we know we know it says calculate the total mass in grams that we, we want we know that the volume that is given is 120 cubic centimeters so the volume produced is 120 cubic centimeters okay it says calculate the total mass in grams of hydrogen gas that was produced assume that molar gas volume at 20 degrees celsius is 24 decimeters cubed so they say that one mole okay at 20 degrees celsius one mole equals 24 decimeters cubed so the first thing we need to do is convert this volume into decimeters cubed and how do we do that we divide by a thousand right so if we do that we go 120 divided by a thousand is going to be naught comma one two decimeters cubed so we have produced naught comma one two decimeters cubed of hydrogen but now the molar volume is 24 so therefore we can say the number of moles is going to be 0, 0,12 divided by 24. Okay, and now we need our calculators. So let's get out the calculator. And do you understand why we're doing this? This is how much we produced. This is how much the volume is of one mole. So obviously if we take that and divide it by the 24, we get out how many moles we actually produced. So let's clear this and it becomes 0, 0.12 divided by 24. And that becomes 0, 0, 0, 0.005. So that's 0, 0, 0, 0.005 moles. But they didn't ask for moles, they asked for the mass of the hydrogen gas. Now that's actually quite easy because number of moles is mass over molar mass. Therefore mass is number of moles times by the molar mass. But the molar mass of hydrogen is two, hydrogen gas, because it's one times by the two for the diatom molecule. So therefore it becomes 0, 0,005 multiplied by two, which is 0, 0, 0,001 grams because 5 times 2 is 10 so it just takes it up one so therefore the number of grams the total mass of grams of hydrogen gas which is produced in this reaction is not common not one grams hmm okay now it says the experiment is now repeated using magnesium powder of mass 0.12 grams and then we check and go, oh, look, it's the same number of grams, okay? Instead of magnesium ribbon, it is found that the reaction rate increases. Use the collision theory to explain this observation. Okay, grade 12. To use the collision theory, what we need to say is this, that using the powder increases the total surface area which will then increase the reaction rate and yes where you've got to say the important things why because it increases 
the possibility or chance, okay, the chance of more, wait for it, effective collisions per unit time. That is what they're looking for. They're looking for the fact that an increase in surface area will increase their action rate. Why? Because it increases the possibility or chance of more effective collisions per unit time. If you do not include the per unit time, then you're not talking rate. You're just talking about the fact that there's going to be more collisions. And that's not great. It has to be the chance of more effective collisions. Why effective? Because they're the ones that have the reactions per unit time time. Okay, one more question and then we're going to move on to chemical equilibrium. Yay! Okay, so it says, the apparatus below is used to investigate the effect of a certain factor on the rate of reaction of calcium carbonate powder and calcium carbonate chunks of diluted hydrochloric acid. Okay, so if you read this, you've got calcium carbonate powder and carbonate calcium carbon chunks and it says that they are using it to investigate the effect of a certain factor on the rate of the reaction. But look here, he has powder and he has chunks. So which factor are they looking at? They're looking at surface area, right? So we immediately know that we're looking at an an experiment with surface area, okay? It says that no NAS try again. A known mass of calcium carbonate powder was added to excess diluted hydrochloric acid. And the decrease in mass of a certain time interval is recorded. Headings were ta readings were taken every 30 seconds. Okay, so here is the mass of calcium carbon powder and the decrease in mass. So after zero seconds, there is zero decrease. And then after, do you see after four seconds, there is a decrease of two grams and then it doesn't change. Okay. Experiment B, we have calcium carbonate chunks. Here is the decrease in mass. And again, it stops at two grams. Okay. So this, now it says formulate an investigative question for this investigation. Okay. So now what's important, grade 12, is that you guys need to realize that there's a difference between an hypothesis and an investigative question. An hypothesis will state, make a statement and it will refer to refer to um, variables to each other and it doesn't have to be correct, okay? So in other words, my, um, in other words, the, your statement doesn't have to be correct about the two variables. So in other words, in this case, an hypothesis would be um, an increase in surface area will decrease the reaction rate or an increase in surface area will increase the reaction rate, okay? It can't be the reaction rate is affected by a change in surface area. You need to relate two variables and state how you think they're going to change. An investigative question, first of all, has to have a question mark at the end. If you do not have a question mark at the end, it is not an investigative question and they're going to mark it wrong. I know it's ridiculous, but there you go. And then what you're doing is you're saying how will this happen? Okay, so it would be, in this case, it would be, how does a change in the surface area affect the rate of the reaction? That's it. Okay. Now it says, write down a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between calcium carbonate and dilute hydrochloric acid. Okay, so what they're looking for is the fact that you should know that if you've got calcium carbonate plus an acid, okay, what do you form? You should you should know that if you've got an acid and a base, you always form a salt and water. If you've got a carbonate, you form the salt, the water, and carbon dioxide. And remember what we say about the salt. The salt is not table salt. It's not that. It is an ionic compound which, when dissolved in water, well, forms ions, okay? So it's going to be calcium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water. And how do I know it's calcium chloride? Well, if you think about it, look here. We know that we're forming carbon dioxide, right? We know we're forming water. So there's my carbons and oxygens used up, okay? 
immediately I've got two hydrogens, so we need to fix that. That's going to be horrible, but no, we'll worry about that in a minute. And what's left is the calciums and the chlorine. So it has to be calcium chloride. Calcium chlorine is got... Okay, it's CO3 to minus. Yeah, that's right. Carbonate is CO3 to minus, therefore calcium is 2. Also, calcium is in group 2, so therefore you know it's got an um, ionic um, charge of 2 plus. Okay, so now let's have a look at balancing this thing. So, do you agree we've got two hydrogens here? So, we need a bit of 2 here. And let me just erase that because it's a horrible 2 and write it again. And let's see now. So now we've got one calcium, one calcium, one carbon, one carbon, three oxygens, three oxygens, two hydrogen, and two chlorines. Yay, it wasn't horrible at all. Yay, yay, yay. Easy peasy. Now it says, using the tables above, draw two graphs on the graph sheet comparing the decrease in mass versus time. Okay, so we didn't actually get a new graph paper, so we're going to draw it. But it, looking at the decrease in mass, please note we're looking at the decrease in mass. So we're going from 0 to 2. Okay, so we're going from 0 to 2 versus time. Okay, so do you agree that we're just going to break this up into, we'll make this 1 and we'll make that 2, just to make it easy. So the first one we're going to do is we're just going to look at this first one and we're going to say, okay, when time is 0, obviously it's 0. And we're going to break it up into 7 bits, so it becomes 1, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, now, um, what are we gonna do? We now need to plot these points. So when X is naught, Y is naught, because this is gonna be decrease in mass, in grams. Okay, and I'll do the black one. I'll do this one in black, the first reaction, and I'll do the second one in a different color. So when x is 1, y is 0, 9. When x is 2, y is 1, 6. When x is 3, y is 1, 9. And then from then on, it is 2 and it stays across. So it goes and they're supposed to be just parallel. Okay, right. I apologize for the bad drawing. Okay, so that is this one. Now let's look at the next one. When X is, now this is calcium carbonate chunks, okay? When X is naught, Y is naught. When X is 1, Y is 0 0.5. When X is 2, Y is 1. When X is 3, Y is 1.4. When X is 4, Y is 1.8. Seven. When x is five, y is one point nine, and then it goes off. So, do you see what's going on here? Okay. So now we've drawn them. Okay, and obviously this is B, and the black one is A. Okay. Now it says which reaction reaches completion first. Well, it's obviously A. A, the black one, reaches completion first because it reaches at Two, it reaches there at two first, and then it just stays there. Then it says, "What? How does the loss in mass compare after the completion of both reactions? Do you agree that the loss of mass is the same? Yeah, it is two, and yeah, it is two. So they are the same. And why are they the same? Because they had the same amount of calcium carbonate in. Okay, and they. How do we know that? Because it says that this is, yeah, wait, 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 a known mass of calcium carbonate powder was added, okay? And the point is that the procedure was then repeated some using chunks of calcium carbonate. And it's got excess dilute hydrochloric acid. So there's more than enough hydrochloric acid. So what has been used up is the calcium carbonate. And then finally, it says, what conclusion can be drawn from this investigation? Well, the conclusion that can be drawn is an increase in the surface area will increase the rate of reaction. There you go. How easy was that? Hey, not too difficult. You just need to go through things step by step. 
Okay, right, let's talk chemical equilibria. And the reason we like teaching chemical equilibria and rates of reaction um, one after the other is because, first of all, they go hand in hand, and secondly, kids tend to get them confused. So let's first talk about the definition of dynamic equilibria. Okay, so just in a second. In this graph here, do you see that it, got, it went flat? And in the previous graph here, now, in rates of reaction questions, when the graphs go flat like this, it means they have stopped. They have run to completion. When we see graphs in chemical equilibria that are flat, it doesn't mean they've run to completion. 99% of the time, it means that, means that they've reached dynamic chemical equilibria. And that is when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So there is no macroscopic change. No macroscopic change. We can't see a change happening on a microscopic level. We will see particles breaking up and forming other particles and vice versa. But on the macroscopic level, we won't see any change. Okay? So let's talk about open and closed systems. An open system is one whose borders allow the movement of energy and matter into and out of a system. So for example, typical example is if you've got a beaker of water where there's no lid, this is an open system. That means that it could rain into the beaker, we could pour water into it, or this could evaporate and evaporate right out of the beaker, okay? This is a closed system because all of the water and the water vapor is kept in the container itself. You can't actually escape from it and nothing can get into it either, okay? Nothing can get into it either. A closed system in which, okay, fine, we've spoken about that. Right now, reversible reactions. This is important. You cannot have dynamic chemical equilibria unless you have a reversible reaction, okay? So reversible reaction is a chemical reaction that can proceed in both the forward and reverse directions. And I've got a little, hang on, let me just erase all the writing here. Um, I've got a little picture here, a little diagram, animation that shows reversible reactions. So what we have here is we have a molecule, calcium carbonate, which when dissolved, breaks up into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. And you can see it happening in the background there. So calcium oxide and carbon dioxide are, then what can happen is when you heat it up, the carbon dioxide and calcium oxide can form calcium carbonate again. So you end up with this reversible reaction where multiples of these things are breaking up and reforming. And they don't have to be the same ones, okay? But that is dynamic equilibrium. Dynamic equilibrium is when the rate at which the calcium carbonate is breaking up into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide is exactly the same as the rate at which these two are forming calcium carbonate. Okay, now, what you need to understand is dynamic equilibrium and this graph. Okay, so let's say, for example, we have a reaction where we've got a container, okay, and into the container we pump some hydrogen gas and some iodine gas. Okay, so after a while, it becomes that the hydrogen gas, which you need to understand, the hydrogen gas and iodine gas will immediately form some hydrogen iodide. Okay, in fact, one of these molecules and one of these molecules form two molecules of hydrogen iodide, okay? But the second that the hydrogen iodide is formed, it starts breaking up and forming hydrogen iodine, exactly like what happened in this, um, this video here. Yeah. You had your calcium carbonate, it broke up immediately into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. The minute that the calcium oxide and carbon dioxide are formed, they immediately start forming calcium, carb calcium carbonate again, okay? So they will immediately reform. But dynamic equilibrium re is reached when the rate at which they're forming and breaking up is the same. Okay, so now immediately some of the hydrogen iodide is going to go back and form hydrogen iodine. So 
what happens is because we were told that we had hydrogen iodine put in, we know that the forward reaction starts with lots of hydrogen iodide and we have a very fast rate of reaction because this is, please understand the most important thing about this section is reading the y axis because you read to need to read all the y axis. In this case, we're looking at rates of reaction. So we're looking at the speed at which this reaction occurs. And obviously, since we've got lots of hydrogen, lots of iodine, we have a huge forward reaction happening of hydrogen iodine form hydrogen iodide. Now, like I said, the minute the hydrogen iodide is formed, what happens? It starts form hydrogen and iodine, okay? Now, initially, because there's very little of the hydrogen iodide, this reaction is going to be a bit slow. But eventually, this reaction is going to speed up and this reaction is going to slow down until you get to a point where we've reached dynamic equilibrium. And at that point, your hydrogen plus your iodine is in dynamic equilibrium with your hydrogen iodide. That means your hydrogen iodide is breaking up to form hydrogen and iodine at exactly the same rate that the hydrogen and iodine are breaking up to form hydrogen iodide, okay? So this is a dynamic equilibrium graph and you need to know that the forward reaction is always the one that comes from the top. Why? Because that's the stuff you started with. So you start off with a very high reaction rate and then you slow down. This, you start the reverse reaction. We started zero because we initially had no product and then it speeds up and then you get to a point where you're ending up with dynamic equilibrium. Right, so now let's talk about the equilibrium constant. So if you've got this reversible reaction, which is some random reversible reaction, AA plus BB, C, C plus DD, but A and B are the reactants and C and D are the products, right? And little AB, little B, little C, little D are the coefficients which form the, um, are the coefficients from the balanced reaction, okay? So in other words, if I had H2 plus I2 is in dynamic equilibrium with 2HI. We wouldn't have ABCD. It would be just A plus B is equal to 2C. Okay, that's all we're having. And this would be 1A and 1B. Okay, that's what it would be. Okay, so now the equilibrium constant, this is the definition is the ratio between the concentration of the products and reactants in a chemical reaction. Okay, it's a ratio of the concentration of the products and reactants in chemical reaction. And it's given by this, where Kc is the concentration of that product to the power of its coefficient multiplied by the concentration of its product to the power of its coefficient divided by a to the power of a b to the power of b. And remember that these square brackets mean concentration of, concentration of, okay. So now also another thing that's important about this KC, and we will talk about it a little bit later again, is the only things that we can use the KC are the aqueous solutions in, a, in, a, in an equation and the gases. And why is that? Because concentration of pure liquids or solids equals one. Okay, it's just equal to one because they are so closely packed. And pure liquids, we're not talking about aqueous. Aqueous is when we dissolve, say for example, a salt in water, that is an aqueous solution. We're talking pure liquids. In other words, they're just made up of that substance, like mercury, just being made up of mercury, then there is no concentration other than the number one. Okay, so let's look at an example. It says hydrogen gas plus iodine gas from hydrogen iodide, okay? You notice these are all gases, so life is cool. Now it says the above reaction is carried out in a 500, that's supposed to be cubic centimeter flask, okay? At equilibrium at 448 degrees Celsius, We'll worry about temperatures later. The quantities are 0 0.92, 0 0.92 moles of H2, 0 0.7 moles of I2, and 6 moles of hydrogen iodide. Calculate the Kc. So the first thing we need to do is write down Kc. Kc is going to be the concentration of Hi, all squared, all over the concentration of H2, 
multiplied by the concentration of I2. Okay, now notice that these are concentrations and these are moles and that's a volume. So concentration is number of moles over volume. So the number of moles of hydrogen, the concentration of hydrogen, is going to be the number of moles, which is 0, 0,92, over 500 cubic centimeters, but we need to get it to decimeters cubed. So we need to divide that by what? Okay, let me help you. We've got King Henry died miserable death. Ah, whatever. Um, King Henry died a miserable death called measles. Okay, right. So this here is a meters or whatever. Then this is deci. This is centi. And this is milli. Okay. So normally to get from centi to deci, we divide by 10. But this is cubed. So we need to divide by a thousand. So it's not it's going to be 0, 0,5 decimeters cubed. So therefore my concentration is going to be 0 0.92 divided by 0, 0,5, which equals what? So let's work that out. So it's going to be 0, 0,92 divided by 0 0.5 equals 1.84. So that's 1,84. So right, so now I know H2. Now I need to find I2, and please note that this is at equilibrium, so that means we can use this. Always check that you've got the equilibrium values. So the concentration of I2 is going to be 0, 0,78 over 0, 0,5. So let's find out what that is. So that is 0, 0.78 divided by 0, 0.5. And that is 1,56, that's 1,56. And then finally, hydrogen iodide, they've told us it's six moles. So the concentration of hydrogen iodide is going to be six divided by 0, 0,5, which should be 12. Okay, I'm just gonna check that because I'm having a blind day, 0 0.6 divided by, let's try again. Clear. 6 divided by 0.5 equals 12. See? So now we need to use our KC. So we're going to say KC, let's put this down. So we're going to KC is equal to concentration of hydrogen iodide, which is 12 squared, over the concentration of the hydrogen, which we worked out to be 1.84 multiplied by the concentration of the iodine, which is 1,56. So we're going to pop that in our calculators. Okay, so we can use this. And we can say 12 squared is 144. Whoopsie. So we don't need that. All over 1.84 multiplied by 1.56. And that equals, sure, big number, 50,17. 50 comma one seven. So normally in this type of question, I would now say to you, what does this value of KC mean? But this is just a really basic example for you guys to work out KC and we haven't discussed what KC means yet. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Let's carry on. Now, sometimes when you're working out KC, you need to use what they've called a rice table. Um, you guys might notice sumic, start, used, made, and then equilibrium, and then concentration. Um, some of you might note a Shrek. It's start, uh, change, well, skek, start, change, equilibrium, and concentration. Okay. So it doesn't matter what you know it as. The whole point is that you write the reaction out. You put in your initial quantities, you write what's changed, you get your equilibrium concentration, and equilibrium quantity and change to concentration. So we're going to do a couple of these examples to show you how to use it. I really don't mind whether you use rice or you use sumac or you use skek or change. I don't mind as long as you get the table right, okay? So it says carbon monoxide and hydrogen react as follows. You've got carbon monoxide plus hydrogen gives you ammonia. No, sorry, that's methane, methane, 
plus water. Okay. Then it says when one mole of carbon monoxide reacts to the three moles of hydrogen in a 10 decimeter cube container at 920 degrees, 27 degrees Celsius, the reaction reaches equilibrium with 0.4 moles of water in the equilibrium mixture. Calculate the molar composition of the equilibrium mixture and Kc. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use sumac, okay, because I'm used to using that. So you've got carbon monoxide plus three hydrogen is in dynamic equilibrium with methane plus water. Okay, so you now have the reaction. Okay, let's do rice. Rice is initial change equilibrium and equilibrium. Okay, so let's do rice because they've given us. So it's rice R. Then we've got initial. Then we've got change, then we've got equilibrium quantity, and then you've got the concentration. Okay, so now what, that's that's what our graph should look like, our table should look like. Now it says that we were given some information. It says one mole of carbon monoxide and three moles of hydrogen are in a 10 cubic decimeter cubed container. Okay, so this is the equilibrium concentration, right? So you want to get concentration and we know concentration is number of moles over volume. This lot here is always in moles. This bit here is what we, how we work out the concentration for our Kc. So what I would do is I would immediately go, well, we know the concentration is number of moles over volume. So we're going to work that out. So we're going to go, well, this number here divided by the volume is going to give me my concentration. So I'm going to go over 10, over 10, over 10, over 10. That is reminding me to take this equilibrium quantity divided by 10 to get the concentration. Okay, and why am I dividing it by 10? Because the, mo the volume is 10 cubic centimeters. Now it says the reaction reaches equilibrium with 0.4 moles of water, 0.4 moles of water in the equilibrium mixture. So it's calculate the molar composition, com composition of the equilibrium mixture. So we need to work that out. And then obviously this to get our Kc. Okay, so yes, trick. The trick is you always first of all write in what you've been given. Now, They've told us that we've got one mole of carbon monoxide and three moles of hydrogen. They don't say anything about methane and water initially. And so because they don't say anything, we can assume that there is zero here, unless they tell you otherwise, okay? Which means what? It means that we have made 0.4 moles of water. Now, this dude here, this, X, this bit here with the change, this is the thing that we use with the ratios of the I mean, of the coefficients, okay? So what are we saying? We're saying we made 0.4 moles of water, but the ratio is one to one. Okay, now we can, we're going to compare everything with this water, okay? So if the ratio of this is one to one, if we made 0.4 moles of water, how many moles of methane must we have made as well? We must have also made 0.4 moles, right? How do I know that? Because this is a ratio of one to one. So if I made 0.4 moles of water, I must have made 0.4 moles of carb of methane, which means I must have used up one mole of carbon monoxide. Sorry, this one. If it's ratio is one to one, the ratio of this is if I made one mole of methane, I must have used up one mole of carbon monoxide. But I didn't make one. I made 0.4. So if I made 0.4, I must have used up 0.4. I used it up, so it's a minus. Now, the only other one is the tricky one is this ratio here of three. So that's a ratio of one to three. So I need to multiply this by three. So you've got 0, 0,4 multiplied by three, by three is going to be 1, 2, which means I've used up 1, 2 moles of my hydrogen gas. And now we're going to look at what we've got left over. So what do we have left over? We have one minus 0.4, which is 0, 0,6. 
we've got 3 minus 1.2, which is 1 comma 8. Yeah, we've made 0.4 because we started with 0 and this is still 0.4. So you need to understand that what we've got is we're saying that this here is our recipe. Our recipe says that one mole of carbon monoxide reacts with three moles of hydrogen to give you one mole of methane plus one mole of water. Awesome. They tell us that they gave us one mole of carbon monoxide and three moles of hydrogen. However, we only formed 0.4 moles of water. The ratio here is one to one. So if I'd used up all my carbon monoxide, I would have made one mole of water, but I didn't. I only made up 0.4. So now we have to use that 0.4 as a backward ratio to find how much we actually formed and used. So now, at equilibrium, we've got 0.6 of these, we've got 1.8 of these, we've got 0.4 of these, and we've got 0.4 of these, okay? Right, everybody happy with that? Now, all we have to do is divide it by the 10 to find the concentration. So 0.6 divided by 10 is 0,06, 1.8 divided by 10 is 0,18, 0.4 divided by 10 is 0,04, and 0.4 divided by 10 is 0,04. Right, and at that point, grade 12, I'm going to stop. I would like to suggest that you try and work out your KC for tomorrow, if you can. If you're not, don't stress. We will carry on from here tomorrow. Have a great day or night.